Now it's time to look at the Lorentz transformations. So we have um, two coordinate systems. We could look over here. We have a coordinate system corresponding to one observer. Let's say that observer is A. This is his world line. And then we have another coordinate system, the red grid, corresponding to another observer. Let's say her coordinate system is x prime t prime, and maybe she's observer B. And they're moving relative to each other. Um, and that's what makes necessitates some different coordinate systems. Remember, they should both be Lorentz coordinate systems, so that they're built out of orthogonal uh, grids. And of course, the reds really are orthogonal to each other. It just doesn't look like it. So to simplify the picture, what we've got is just the x and t axes for observer A, and the x prime and t prime axes for observer B. And we want to describe some vector u. And so that could be a, a velocity vector, a momentum. It could just be a position of something. It could be anything that's, that's reasonably described as a vector. And um, I want to go from u, let's again, like we had before, we'll just call it equals ux ut, although that really means this actual geometric object, when expressed in terms of observer a, it's got these two numbers. But I'll just I'll privilege observer a a little bit. And then we want to figure out what are the numbers u x prime and u t prime that observer b would measure here. Well, it's exactly the same same deal, uh, same situation as in uh, Euclidean geometry. We're just going to project. It's just orthogonal projection looks a little different. We're going to project that down here and that down here. And so that this projection here is going to be u x prime, and this projection here is going to be u t prime. I can't see that very well. OK. So we know how to do projections. We just need to find a vector along this direction, a vector along this direction, and use our projection formula. Um, I'm going to stop using the colors because it's a little slow. Um, so what we need is a vector, say, w, and then a vector z, just like we had before, along those axes. Um, so now we have to describe, well, exactly how much is x prime different from x? How much is t prime different from t? Well, the way we have of usually of describing this is that a and b are in relative motion to each other. And we're just going to describe it by the relative velocity of b with respect to a. OK, so that's, I claim that's exactly analogous to the slope description that we had uh, that we know is not really the ideal description for the Euclidean rotation situation. But it's the natural place to start because we're used to describing things in terms of velocity. So if the velocity of b relative to a is v, then we've, di we've seen this before, like with the train problem. Then w, well, let's see, let's do z first. It's a little easier. z is something that um, in one unit of time, according to observer a, uh, observer b moves v units of distance. Okay, so that's that we've seen as um, the description of a vector along of somebody's world line moving with relative velocity v, and then of course to get w that's perpendicular to that, we just do the switch trick and not flip a sign because these are going to be Minkowski orth orthogonal. Okay, so now we're ready to project. Let's scoot it in here. Okay, so u sub x prime. B's version of this vector is going to be, now I'm going to use the angle bracket notation to emphasize that we're in the Minkowski case. It's exactly the same formula, though. Remember, projections work exactly the same. That's the nice thing about projections. Um, and so that's going to be the inner product of ux ut with w is going to be ux plus v ut divided by the magnitude of w. The magnitude of that is the square root of 1 minus v squared. Hey, that's a familiar thing. That's gamma. So it's gamma times ux plus v ut. Not too surprising to see the gamma factor come in there. OK. And then ut prime is the same thing, but with projecting on z. So it's just inner product of u with z over magnitude of z. Magnitude of z is still gamma. And so we just get gamma. The magnitude of this, uh, the dot product, oh, I've erased it all. But it's just going to be, um, the v is just going to appear in a different place, v u x plus u t. You can go back and see the definition, but it's pretty easy. OK, so 
Uh, I think it's finally time to erase this up here, and I'm going to... I hate to erase pictures, but I want the room. Okay, I'll bring it back later. Okay, so um, what we get in matrix form is that ux prime, ut prime, is going to be gamma, gamma v, gamma v, gamma, times ux, ut. Or I could factor out a... So that, let me just say what the L for Lorentz transformation. It's going to be Lorentz tra transformation with velocity v, is the gamma calculated from that v, and then just 1 v, v1. Or if I want it very explicit, 1 over 1 minus v root 1 minus v squared, 1 v, v1. Not so bad, and very analogous to what we had, of course, for Euclidean geometry. Well, it's just some signs changed. This, is, this was a plus changed to a minus. This was a minus changed to a plus. That shouldn't be too shocking, because that's how we changed Euclidean plane geometry to Lorentz plane geometry. Um, notice, this is still something, this is really something that's going to work um, in its most basic form in, in more dimensions. What we have, if you have two or three space dimensions, is the possibility that you could also be Euclidean rotating in those dimensions, as well as comparing two uh, observers that are in relative motion. This is called a boost. This kind of Lorentz transformation is called a boost. You can combine it with rotations, um, but that's not really the, the interesting thing here. Okay, we want to focus on what's new, not what's old. Okay, so um, this is fairly nice, and it really is exactly the um, formula, standard formula for Lorentz transformations, but I really want to show that there's better things that, that we should be looking for guided by the geometry. In particular, describing things with velocity v, I claim is exactly analogous to describing things with a slope, and that wasn't good, in particular wasn't additive. So one example would be, suppose you boost two relative, um, two observers that are, one of them is moving at uh, speed three quarters, okay? And then you bring in another observer that is moving at speed, relative speed three quarters to the second observer. If these, let's say V1 and V2, if you could add those relative velocities, you get a speed bigger than the speed of light. And we know that that's not supposed to happen. We're not supposed to have a relative velocity that, is, that are bigger than the speed of light. Okay, So certainly, there's no way these could be additive. Just like slopes weren't additive, again, the geometric uh, analogy suggests that it would be silly to even expect this. This is not something weird about relativity in, from this perspective. It's something that's natural. Again, What's weird by, in comparison to Newtonian mechanics is not weird when you compa compare to Euclidean geometry. Okay, So let's do another example numerically. Let's say, um, suppose we had v1 equals v2 equals 1 half. Okay, And I want to figure out what the corresponding um, double boost is. So we've got one coordinate system, x and t, then another, and that's a's coordinate system. And then we've got, let's see, in red, we've got b's coordinate system, x prime and t prime, and then maybe in blue, we've got x double prime, t double prime, so that the blue observer is moving with speed half the speed of light relative to the red, and the red observer is moving half the speed of light relative to the green. How fast is blue moving with respect to green? Well, we can answer that now, and then we're going to get a, a, a nice fancier way to do it once we do the, the better version of Lorentz transformations. But let's do it this way. Um, we can just answer it using the transformations we've had. We're going to do two Lorentz transformations with uh, velocity 1 half. And then we're going to see, is the comp composition, the, the product of those two matrices, is that a Lorentz transformation? And if so, for what velocity? It better be a Lorentz transformation, or else this doesn't make any sense. And we can figure out the velocity. So uh, what's the gamma for 1 half? It's, uh, it turns out to be 2 over root 3. Not hard to figure out. Okay, So what we get is 2 over root 3, and then 1, 1 half, 1 half, 1, times itself. I could just write squared, but if we want to be able to see how these matrices multiply out, it's probably a good idea to write it out. OK, so we're going to get 4 thirds from the scalars multiplying together. And then 1 times 1, a half plus plus a half, that's going to be 5 fourths. And then 1 times a half, a half times, ooh, that's 1. And then 1, and then 5 fourths. 
And then the all in all, if you bring in the four four thirds, it's five thirds. That doesn't come out very well. Five thirds, four thirds, four thirds, five thirds. Now that definitely has the right pattern to be a Lorentz transformation. These two are equal, these two are equal. And then the question is, what's the velocity? Well, that's easy to figure out. If you go back to the formula, remember LV was gamma times 1 V V1. So if you are looking at a Lorentz transformation matrix and you want to figure out what's the mystery velocity, just take this entry and divide it by this one, or divide it by this one, or take this one, divide it by this one, whatever you want to do. So in here, the mystery velocity is 4 thirds over 5 thirds, or 1 over 5 fourths. It's 4 fifths. So we get a rule 1 half plus a half is 4 fifths. That's a nice little cocktail party thing. It's like I know in what, se in what setting a half plus a half is equal to 4 fifths. I should tell my son that, actually. Um, he'd, he'd be amused. And it really means that a relative velocity of a half and a relative velocity of a half combine to be not 1 but 4 fifths. Again, really surprising from a Newtonian point of view. It's totally different from what Newtonian mechanics would predict. If somebody's coming at you in a train that's going half the speed of light, which is pretty cool, and then throws something at you, a baseball, at half the speed of light, really good throwing arm, you're not going to get something, what you see of that baseball is not something coming at you at speed uh, equal to the speed of light. It'll come at you at speed four-fifths of the speed of light. So really surprising from a Newtonian point of view, but again, utterly unsurprising in analogy to Euclidean geometry. Because we don't expect slopes to add when we compare different lines and coordinate systems, and we shouldn't expect this analog of, of slope, the velocity, to be additive either. Okay? So the task now is to find the analog of um, the 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 correct analog of the rotation, the angle of a description of rotation. Okay. Before we do that, we can actually just go ahead and get the law for um, combination of velocities in general. Why don't we do that? Suppose I have a relative velocity v1 and relative velocity v2. Let's just do the calculation we did as an example uh, in general. Okay, so I'm just going to have these matrices for the Lorentz transformations. I'm going to multiply those matrices. So you get gamma 1, gamma 2. Okay, that's nice. But the main thing is get these numbers. So you get 1 times 1, v1 plus times v2. Okay, add them together. You get v1 plus v2. And then we know these have to be the same, but switched. And you can check. It really does work. This says that, that Lorentz transformations form a group, by the way, just like rotations do, if you know what that means. And so the, gam the velocity 3 remember, is just the ratio of this over this. So it's v1 plus v2 over 1 plus v1 v2. Uh, if you remember your trig really well, that may look slightly familiar, um, and we'll see why uh, pretty soon. Um, but what it really is saying, what one thing it says is that if v1 and v2 are small, if their product is small compared to 1, it's going to appear like the Newtonian rule, which is better because we didn't, never noticed this until we thought about high velocities and things like that. Um, and v1, v2 is likely to be quite small, because v1 and v2 individually are probably a lot less than 1. So their product is much, much less than 1. So this is going to be a pretty small effect until both these velocities are appreciable compared to the speed of light. In particular, if only one of them is small, uh, you're still going to see something pretty close to v3 equals v1 plus v2. Okay. Now, this is an ugly law. It's, it's real. But it's kind of ugly, and it's exactly analogous to how slopes would combine um, for rotations. Um, and so we want to figure out what's the analog of angle, and that will be in the next video.